So I'll say again real quick before um, we go on, just in case those of you who weren't here before, next week we meet, we begin meeting at Celebration Church on Buck Mountain Road at 430. So this is our last Sunday here. We're very grateful to this church and um, we're going to send them a thank you and that kind of thing on behalf of all of us. But, oh yeah, the kids can go with Jessica and Angela. Um, Dave's in Costa Rica, so he's got a team of college students from Davidson College with him, and actually Lynn went to um, help with that team. So Jason and Sarah and Lynn and Dave are um, with a bunch of college kids, and I'm sure they are having a good time. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about um, growing up. So this is... I know I keep, I, I, if you've come Wednesday nights or any other time, I keep coming back to this theme because I just, it's just something that's on my, my heart. I, um, you know, when we started this church, you have lots of ideas about what you want the church to look like and what you want it to be, and, um, and sometimes God just starts speaking to you about things that you weren't expecting, and so the, the passage he's put so heavy in my heart is Ephesians, um, where it talks about growing up into the fullness of, um, of Christ. So um, could you, Caroline, turn those lights up just a little bit? So how many, who of you said something this week you wish you hadn't have said? Who this week thought something that you shouldn't have thought? Who, um, who did something this week you shouldn't have done? Who just like blew it this week? So we're all in good company, right? Welcome to sanctification and to process. We are all in process and um, we're gonna, pr- I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna get into it. Father, I just thank you for your word. I pray, God, this word will be encouraging to your people. I pray, God, that um, there'll be a sense of lightness to it, even though your word is true and serious. We know that you're a good father who wants to teach us good things. So I pray, God, that you would come and that the spirit would speak and that the spirit would be our teacher tonight. We thank you for your, for your truths. That, that create a clear path for us. We bless you in Jesus' name. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to read real quick. Ephesians lays out the, the foundation and, and kind of it's the blueprint for the church. And it reveals to us like the high calling of the church, our purpose as the church. And um, in Ephesians 1 through 3, Paul kind of lays a foundation and then and when he gets to chapter 4, he kind of starts laying out like what the church is supposed to look like. And I'm just going to read this one verse. Um, it talks in Ephesians 4 that, that God gave gifts to man so that they could equip the church to do the ministry. And, and it's for the service and the building up of the body of Christ. So we know that we all have gifts. Your gift was given for the edification of the church, not just for yourself. So, it was given until we attain, this is verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to a measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So, I, I, I think the reason I've been, I guess like doing what Dave and I are doing, we're more like intricately involved in people's lives than, than we w- you know, were just doing when we were just doing missions. We would be just in missions we were, but just very like on the mission field or we weren't consistently with a group of people. And so pastoring a church, we are with people on a more, we're getting to know people. It's like family gets to know each other. And so in that process, I, I um, there are just there are just things that that come up, and it's like, wow, like we're still drinking milk when we should be eating meat, 
or we're still at this stage and we should be at this stage or you know I, I tend to see like where it is God wants us to go and and maturity and to and a full the full stature of Christ is his goal for us like if you want to know what the will of God is for your life you want to know what God's purpose is for your life simply put it's that the image of his son be formed in you it's that his his purpose and his will is that we become like his son and and so we ask you know like what's God's will for my life am I supposed to go here am I supposed to do this am I supposed to marry that person marry that person you know who am I supposed to be with today like we want to know God's will right and God's plan and 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 those are good things and and that's a part of our journey but ultimately the purpose God has for us is that we become like his son that we that when others see us they see Jesus that is his purpose for our life and in Ephesians 1 through I'm just going to kind of I just kind of paraphrase 1 through chapters 1 through 3 so you can just kind of listen or you can kind of skim the verses if you want to but basically Paul comes to the church of Ephesus and and he says hey church you need to know that he chose you, that you are blameless and pure in his sight. He came and he died and he gave forgiveness for your sins. And you've obtained an inheritance, a blessing. And you're called according to his purpose. And he goes on in chapter 1 and says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may know that you may know the power that is within you, that you may know in fullness what Christ did for you. He, he says, I want you to know the inheritance that you have in the saints, with the saints. He says, in it goes on in chapter 2, he says, you were dead in sin and formerly walked according to this world and to the prince of the air. Like before, you were this, but not now. Now you are this because God was rich in his mercy and because of his great love for you, he made us alive. You were dead, but now he's made, us, made you alive. He's raised you up and seated you at the right hand of the Father where Christ is seated himself. He has come and exchanged something with us. He took our sin and gave us his righteousness and put us at the, at the right hand with his son. This is, this is like a great mystery. This is a mystery that, that all the generations before didn't know. But now it's been revealed. It's been revealed through Jesus who came. He's prepared good works for you. He has a calling on your life. He prepared these works before, before the foundation of the earth. And he plans and intends for you to, to do those good works. He goes on and says that he talks about like this whole household that God is building, this body, both Jew and Gentile, to form this one body, this one group of people into a dwelling place of God. You see, it's not just your salvation and your salvation and your salvation. It's about a corporate thing God wants to do through us, through us, through the church in Roanoke, through the church in Ohio, through the church in Congo, through the church of Jesus Christ. He wants to do something through us. Okay, so it's not just an individual salvation. There's a corporate thing that Paul wants to get across to us. And he goes on in chapter 3 and he talks about what a mystery this is, how all the other generations did not know it, but that it had been revealed. And Paul says, like, it's been my job, this has been my calling to show you this, to reveal this, to explain this mystery to you. And, and he goes on to say um, that the wisdom of God is to be known through the church to even rulers and authorities in heavenly places and in all the earth. It's through us that God wants to, to reveal himself. It's through us. This was God's purpose all along, Paul says. And he says, don't, so don't lose heart over my tribulation and don't lose heart over your tribulations. I pray that God would strengthen you with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you would be rooted and grounded in love, that you would comprehend 
the, the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and the, the love that surpasses knowledge, that you would be filled to the fullness of God. It was all, it was all because of love that God did this. We are his objects of love, and Paul wants, he really wants the church of Ephesus to get this. He wants them to know what Christ did, who they are, and what they're called to do. And he, he ends chapter 3 with saying, Now to him who is able to do far above beyond what we can ask or think according to the power that works within him to be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever. You see, the glory of God resides in us. God doesn't want to hide his glory. He wants to show, demonstrate his glory on the earth. And he does it through his vessels, through us, through the church. So then he goes on to chapter 4 and he says, Now, because of all that I've just told you, now I employ you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. You see... If he doesn't start out by saying, walk this way, do this, be that. He's like, walk in a manner worthy of your calling because of this. Don't you see all of this? Now walk in the, in, in the manner that's worthy of that. Like you are called. You are one of God's chosen ones. So now it's like this beautiful blessing that God's bestowed upon us. Now walk in this. God gave gifts to men in order to equip the saints so that they will attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And he goes on to say, We are no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and the trickery of men and craftiness and deceitful scheming. We are to grow up in all aspects to him who is the head, Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times we want to grow up in power and authority. We want to do these big things. But the scripture says grow up in all aspects of him. Grow up in humility. Growing up in love. Growing up in forgiving others. We are to grow up in all aspects of Jesus. So simply put, God's will for your life is that you are transformed and made into the image of his son in the likeness of his son. That's what, that's what he predestined us for. Romans 8, 28, you were predestined. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Okay, so we're just gonna, we're gonna, so my, what I'm talking about tonight, it's, yeah, I titled it from circumcision to inheritance because there were stages in in the Jewish boy's life and we know that the Old Testament gives us prophetic pictures and shadows of things to come things that were fulfilled in Jesus and things that are still going to be fulfilled there's all these shadows in the Old Testament and and so the first one is um, circumcision and for the you can go to the next slide from the for the Jewish um, boy he was to be circumcised on the eighth day. And it was an outward sign of the covenant relationship that he had with, it, you know, that Israel had with God. Okay, so um, circumcision, it's called in Hebrew, Brit Milah. I don't know Hebrew, but so forgive my pronunciation. Um, but Brit Milah is circumcision, and it foreshadowed the covenant relationship that we would have with Jesus. Okay, it talks about in the New Testament like circumcising our hearts. Okay, so there was a physical circumcision that happened on the eighth day for young boys. It foreshadowed a circumcision coming of, of us. It, it, it's like they were born into the family. It was kind of a celebration of their birth. There's, the circumcision was. Okay, it's talked about in Genesis 17, and God has initiated circumcision with Abraham and said that you will circumcise all of your male sons, males, of course they're sons, um, you will circumcise them on the eighth day and it will be a sign. It's a sign of a covenant that God had with, with Israel. Okay, the next stage of a Jewish boy came at about age 13 and this would be like the bar mitzvah, 
or for a girl. For a girl, it was bar mitzvah. For a boy, it was bar mitzvah. Now, this wasn't established as a ceremony until around the time of the second temple. So it wasn't like a ceremony that God instituted, but it was something that they practiced in their Jewish, in their Jewish history. Um, at around age 12 or 13, the Jewish boy would, would, it was like that was his coming of age, and he would, he would learn the Torah, and he would begin learning the trade of his father. Okay, so the father would take the boy about this age and he would start teaching him wisdom and things of life and teaching him about the family business. And it, and it was a time that the son would learn and he would listen to his father and, and be obedient to his father. Um, he was an heir at this point. He was like a legal heir, but he didn't receive the inheritance yet. Okay, because he wasn't, wasn't ready to receive the inheritance. He was, he was now in this stage of learning and of learning his father and the ways of his father. Um, okay. Like I said, I don't think God didn't institute that ceremony, but he but we see it like even David, the shepherd boy, he you know, he um, took on his father's trade. We see it like when Samuel went to um, you know, he was given to the temple to be raised by the priests and that was because Hannah committed him to the Lord, um, but he went up and was raised by the um, by the priest, teach being you know taught the ways of the Lord. We even see in in Luke two where Jesus, you know, remember he goes to the the temple and at age twelve, and then his parents look for him and then they say he tells them he's like, well, I ha I, I'm about I had to be in my father's house. I'm about my father's business. And so even Jesus, um, kind of at age 12, began that studious time, you know, from learning from the Father. Um, so the next stage is full sonship. And this is where the son receives the father's inheritance. And this was at a time around eight, between ages 20 and 20, well, 20 and 30 probably. And it was a time when the son had reached maturity it was the time that the son was given the birthright. The birthright was like the inheritance, and it usually came with a double portion. Um, we know that Esau was supposed to get the birthright, and Jacob, you know, he sold it for a pot of stew. But also, it, it infers like a time of responsibility. It was a time where he could take, you know, he could represent his father in all of his father's wishes. And, and carry them out. And it was the time, like, he had reached maturity, and it was, he could sign contracts, and it was as good as his father signing them. And he could, you know, he could go in the name of his father. He represented the father. But you see, he had spent years before learning and following and being taught, being instructed in that, in that earlier phase. So, and we know that Jesus, at age 30, when he was baptized and he started his ministry it was like he had reached full maturity and and was now going to do things in the father's name and carry out the father's wishes um, you know Jesus came as a man and he it says that he learned obedience and I think that's in Hebrews so even Jesus learned obedience as a man okay so so these stages just kind of represent and kind of shadow the stages of growth in our own life. Um, first, we're circumcised, and that is like us coming into covenant with, with God, with Jesus. Our hearts are circumcised to him, and, um, and we are his. I, th I think a lot of the problem is that we want to move from circumcision to inheritance immediately. We don't like processes. We don't like, like, the stages of growth that we go through. And, and here's the deal. Like, there's no, like, God loves every stage that we're in. He loves the infant. He loves the toddler. He loves the adolescent. He loves the adult. Like, it's all, it's family to him. But, but his purpose is that he takes this child who is circumcised, and I'm talking about, you know, us when we get circumcised, he takes us 
from this circumcision stage, and he wants to move us into full, the fullness of Christ and into maturity. And that doesn't happen like that, does it? Like, that is a process that is, a, that is like a process of us not getting what we want or, or laying down what we want, and we do it his way. I mean, this stage, the second stage of, you know, the adolescent, basically, you could say. Like, what, what's typical of an adolescent? Rebellion. They want their own way. They, they hold offense when they don't get their own way, and they cop an attitude. Right? Y'all have never been there, have you? So, we're, some of us are still there. <laughs> But, I mean, it's just kind of like this typical stage that, that adolescents go through. They want their own way. They're dem- and if there's not good instruction and discipline, of, you know, then they're like a holy tyrant, you know, the older they get, when they get older. And, and so there is a certain, there's a certain, you know, discipline and there's a certain training that the Lord takes his children through. And it, it's not to be despised, and it's not for us to beat ourselves up if we're not there. But what we need to begin looking at, looking at it as if, here's a trial, what does God want to do? You know, a lot of times when trials come our way, we just, we just want to get rid of the trial, and we want to get on with the next thing. We don't want to go through the hard stuff of learning to forgive, someone who's deeply wounded and hurt us. But the Father wants to shape that in us and mold that in us to where we respond like Jesus would, where his nature is so in us. And so, you know, like how does someone build muscle? They lift weights. Yeah, resistance is what builds the muscle. How does someone run a marathon? They train and... and they work out. They have to discipline themselves and train themselves to get to that point. And the same is true for us as believers, that there is a training and a disciplining and a, and a building up, a strengthening through resistance that God takes us through. And we don't like it. It's not fun. But if we could keep the end goal, that the end goal is that we come into full sonship and to full maturity, where we're moving as a body in the likeness of Jesus, it, it's, that is the goal. Like, that is what God wants to do through and in us. Okay, so um, we'd much rather have the inheritance and not the circumcision, right? Um, we're going to look at three different Greek words for child. The first one is... Um, I think it's pronounced nepios, and it's an infant, and a child, it's a child that's untaught and unskilled, and there's no shame or condemnation in this stage either, like, you know, Jesus, God doesn't expect an infant to run, right? He doesn't expect an infant to even walk, First they learn to sit up, and then they crawl, and then they walk, and then they run. But if we're still crawling when we're 40, there's something wrong. Like, we're meant to mature. We're meant to go through process to, to change into where we can do more things, where we can handle more things, where, where things aren't as, as hard. Right, when we're infants, like, everything's done for us. But when we come a, a, full, man, a full man or woman, then, then we do it ourselves. And this is kind of what God's after, is that we move from an unskilled, untrained child to one who can, can move and do and know the Father and do it. Okay, so these different verses, 1 Corinthians 13, 11, all of the, where you see the word immature or child, it's talking about an infant. So I'm just going to read 1 Corinthians 13, 11. You can look up these later, but um, 1 Corinthians 13, 11.
When I was a child, and that would be who, um, Nepios, when I was a Nepios, I used to speak like a Nepios, think like a Nepios, reason like a Nepios. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. So there is a time, there is a season for this stage, but we're meant to move on. And the next Greek word for child is technon. And this means a disciple. This would be the one, the, the Greek word, like for the one in that season of the, you know, beginning at 12, like one who learns, one who follows a teacher in authority. It's a time when the minds are nourished, the character is developed, a time for one to be trained in his father's business. His disciples were technons, probably, because when Jesus comes and says in John 13, 33, let's turn there. John 13, 33. He says, little children, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will see me as I said to the Jews. Now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot go. That word is technon. So he's talking to his disciples who were, you know, do you remember when the disciples got into a dispute over who's the greatest? You know, who's, they wanted to know who's the greatest, is, am I or, you know. That was like in Luke 22, and it, it's, it's the word technon in there when he's talking to them. Okay, so the next stage after technon is huios. And this is a mature son. Okay, and this means the likeness of, a, of involves likeness, you know, like, like father, like son. Matthew 3, when, when Jesus was being baptized and he came up out of the water, God said, this is my huios in whom I am well pleased. This is my full mature son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 5, when it talks about the peacemakers, and it says the peacemakers will be called sons, huios, because they will be like God. So this Greek word implies full maturity. Okay? So I'm going to read Romans 8.14. Here's another scripture that uses the word huios. It says... Um, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. These are the huios, those being led by the Spirit. This whole process of, of the stages of growth and development, in that, in that stage where we're learning our Father's business and we're learning, you know, remember Jesus said, I came to do only what my Father does? Like he was so in tune with his Father that he did everything he saw his father doing. He didn't even have to ask his father. He prayed, he was in touch with the father, and he moved in the spirit. He was being led by the spirit as a huios, a full-grown, mature son. And that is God's, that is God's will and goal and purpose for us, is that we become mature sons and can move being led by the spirit is this making sense? So, how many of you would rather be a Julios? <laughs> I want to read something that um, Beth Moore wrote that kind of goes along with this. Um, she's writing about her granddaughter. She has a little granddaughter who is a little ballerina. So I'm just going to start here. She says her granddaughter's name is Annabeth. Like most preschoolers, Annabeth's well-protected world is appropriately small and a big part of her small world is her ballet class. It's one of the only things in her little family that only, set, that only she gets to do. She goes to preschool, but brother goes to big school, so there's nothing particularly unique about that. She goes to church, but so does her family. 
She goes to her friends' houses, but usually she's with her mom. She goes out to eat, but poor thing, she never gets to take the car and go by herself. But one day a week, she is the only one in her small world that dons a little black litard, pale pink tights, ballet shoes, and glory be a tutu, and runs on tiptoes into a world of piles and parades. I don't know how to say that. Does anyone know how to say that? Plies? It doesn't have an L in there, but anyway, a ballet term. Part of being a child coming into the knowledge of a great big God through parents who, who esteem his ever presence is picturing that he is involved in whatever he or she is doing. And he is indeed. This is a fact affirmed through the decades that follow and through copious scriptural accounts. Sometimes he's involved through fellowship. Sometimes he's involved through empowerment and anointing. Sometimes he's involved through conviction and chastisement. But as long as it's his child, he is always involved. For Annabeth, in that lyrical moment, it was God right beside her on the dance floor, and he was brilliant. Of course he was. Annabeth was singing a song in the back seat of my car, and it was all about God doing ballet with her. As we grow up in him, inch by inch, we begin to we began the slow journey of divine reversal. We get the ecstatic joy of picturing him involved and invested in whatever we're doing. Lo, I am with you always. But a gradual overtaking of his spirit causes an aching and an awakening within us to do what he is doing. Instead of limiting our vision to God a twirl on our terrestrial dance floors, we begin to picture ourselves in snapshots of sudden truth raised up and seated with him in heavenly places. There we are by position, but on loan here by commission, that his kingdom may come and his will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are not just the calling ones asking God to join us. We are the called ones asked to join him right here, right now, right on this earth, he works, he lives, he breathes, he moves, he saves, he renews. There is no God. This is no God-forsaken world. To Zacchaeus, Jesus said, I'm going to your house today. But to his disciples, he said, come, follow me. Do what I'm doing. Seek to see what I am seeing. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works I do. I come to your world so that you can follow me to mine. This is the picture of a full-grown son. It's not about what I want, what my callings, what my gifts are. Those are important, and God wants to use them. But it's not about, you know, we're not to stay infants where we make it all about us and our world. We're to grow up so that we move into his world and say, what are you doing? I want to join you. I want to do what you're doing. I want to see with your eyes. I want to move in the spirit. This is what God wants for the body of Christ. And I just want to encourage you. I don't want this to be a discouraging message because... It's all good. Like Jesus usually gets what he wants, and he wants us to grow up. He wants us to be conformed into his image. And I, I heard someone say once that God never fails us. He just keeps giving us the test over and over again because he's a good teacher. And so when we don't get it, he's right there to give us the test again. And it may come, you know, it may be different questions on the test. But nonetheless, he is all about you and me becoming a mature man. I remember one time I was um, going through a really difficult time, and do you remember Tony who preached here from, uh, from England a couple months ago? Well, I was going through a really difficult time, and I was talking to his wife, Margaret, and I was telling her just about my woes and how, you know, everything was just so hard, and and she just looked at me in her sweet British accent, and she said, Oh, Joy, I do not feel sorry for you. Which wasn't what I was, ex I was just kind of like, whoa. <laughs> she, 
she's like, God is disciplining you. God is disciplining you. I will not feel sorry for you. And I thought, wow. You know, a lot of times what we want is just someone to feel sorry for us. You know, we just want to stay in our little pity party and just come on in here and get in here with me. And if you can't, then just, you know. But you know what? We've got to grow up and we've got to encourage one another in Christ. So Margaret was saying to me, Joy, I don't feel sorry for you. You're a true daughter of God, and he disciplines those whom he loves. Discipline is not punishment, for punishment has to do with fear. Discipline is about training, equipping, shaping, growing. And he does that to the ones he loves. And he wants to use everything that comes to your, in your life, everything that you go through, he wants to use to make you a full-grown son and make you in the likeness of him, his son Jesus. It's for your benefit. It's for the world's benefit that he does this. My prayer is that we don't short change the process for a quick fix or a quick high, that we won't skip and just run after the inheritance. I want this, I want this, I got to have this. No good parents hands over the inheritance until they are ready to manage the inheritance. We are all children of God, but we are becoming huioses. We are children of God, but we are becoming full, complete men, men and women of God, so that he can say to us, here you go. Here are the keys to the kingdom. Go do this. Go do that. I give you all power, all authority. That's what he wants. But we've got to grow up. We've got to be willing to grow up. We've got to be willing to walk through the fire and the hard times and not resent it and blame him and curse him under our breath because we're going through such a hard time. God doesn't feel sorry for us. He loves us. He knows where we are, and he, he has compassion on us, but he does not really want us to tolerate the spirit of victimization and victim. I'm a victim, and he wants us to move forward and grow up and strengthen our muscles and walk as full men and women with the full stature of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. Turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud, great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There's a prize for us. And not just at the finish line, but there's a prize along the way. There's seeing God and knowing God all along the way. It's not just the prize at the end of the finish line. He is our prize. So let us run the race, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, circumcision, and perfecter, technon, of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. He was huios, the fullness of God. For consider him who had endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. He has a plan. He has a purpose, and he's working it out in you. Work with him. Don't resist him. Let the resistance in your life build you up. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved. Oh, I'm just going to give up, sit down, and I'm done with it. Don't faint. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. 
He scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as his sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we have the earthly father to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more rather be subject to the father of spirit and live? For they disciplined us for a short time and seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Discipline trains us, and when we're trained by discipline, it yields fruit. It yields peace in our life. We all want peace, right? There really is a peace that comes knowing that you're a son who God is he's with, and you've been trained by his, by his hand. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, or rather be healed, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and defile many. For there are no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, and he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Let's not sell our birthright for a pot of stew. Let's not sell our birthright because we're demanding our own way. Let's not sell our birthright because we are bitter and won't let go of it or we won't forgive. Like, we are called to be huyos' full mature sons. Let's not shortchange the process. Embrace the process. Embrace, it can be good. The process can be good because you'll see Jesus in the process. The wilderness for the Israelites, they were being disciplined and trained and learning to hear the voice of God. It wasn't always fun, but they were so well taken care of. Their shoes didn't even wear out. God was with them. He is with us in every stage and in every season of life. Amen.